I'm here to be the guest speaker for the annual dinner for Planned Parenthood of Montana, centered here in Billings. Uh, it's an especially critical time. We've just had the 35th anniversary of Roe versus Wade, which was decided January 22, 1973. And perhaps there's been no criti more critical moment since then until the election, which the nation will select a new president in November, of course. And the importance of that is that whoever is elected president will then have the ability to appoint Supreme Court justices. And the future of Roe versus Wade, in large part, depends on who sits on the U.S. Supreme Court. Can you give me the breakdown of the Supreme Court justices right now? Is sure. really just one person, one judge? There are, it's essentially a 4-4-1 split. Uh, the four judges who've basically been opposed are Scalia, Thomas, Alito, and Roberts has voted with that group in the one case since he's been Chief Justice. The four who are always in favor of privacy women's ability to make their own decisions under Roe are Souter, who is 87, and so I think will retire, not immediately, but sometime fairly soon. Uh, you've got Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's in her 70s, but has had colon cancer and looks very frail, although I hope she will last for a long time. Uh, and then you have Breyer and Souter, with Kennedy, the one in the middle. So Kennedy tended to vote with O'Connor, Sandra Day O'Connor, when she was on the bench, and generally in favor of the principles that the government should not make the most personal decisions. But in the most recent vote, the Gonzalez case, he voted with the Scalia-Thomas faction. So that's why it's such a in-the-balance uh, kind of thing. And one new justice could make a huge difference in the future of the Supreme Court cases. Who do you think, as far as the presidential candidates, would be in line for the pro-choice movement and keeping you know, Roe versus Wade intact? Well, the one who would be the worst would be McCain. Uh, McCain is somebody who has been opposed to Roe versus Wade for a very long time. Um, He's on record in numerous situations saying that he is opposed to the principles of Roe versus Wade. Either Obama or Clinton have 100% pro-choice records. So either of those would, I think, be someone who would appoint justices that would be in favor of the principle that you get to make your choices, not the government. Right. Okay, um, can you tell us a little bit about I mean, you've had a very personal experience in more than one way with this instance. What would it mean to you today if Roe versus Wade were to be reversed? Well, it's not just me. I mean, you do have the fact that Roe versus Wade was my first contested case, uh, which I won in the U.S. Supreme Court. I was a young lawyer, but I was willing to volunteer my time because it was a time when abortion was illegal and where so many women were having self or illegal abortions. And at that point, our Texas hospitals had what was called IOB wards, infected obstetrics wards. And so it was women who had tried self-abortion or illegal abortion who were often uh, sometimes dying, but often with infections and all kinds of medical problems. And so the doctors who were head of our public hospitals and who were having to treat those women were saying, we have got to change the law. And I was so sad to come here to Montana and realize that there was a young woman in Missoula just within the last week, I guess, outstanding student, great athlete who had become pregnant. and who committed suicide. Those were the stories you heard all the time before Roe versus Wade, and my hope was that we would never hear them again. So now is a pretty critical time. It's very critical because the Supreme Court is on such a narrow margin with who's gonna be the justices, who will make those decisions in the future. And it's, it's wonderful that a, young, a generation younger than I cannot remember a time when abortion was not legal. And so it's easy to take it for granted. 
Uh, in fact, when I started Roe versus Wade, the University of Texas Health Center would not allow a woman to have contraception unless she certified she was within six weeks of marriage because they thought you didn't need to be on the pill until you were ready for your wedding night. And the problem was there were a number of unplanned pregnancies. And then to hear that there's a pharmacist here in this state who is in a little town, not another pharmacy for 80 miles, who has just decided that he doesn't want to give women birth control. And so it's like the, the refrains of the past that we fought so hard against in the 70s are being heard again here. I was here uh, four years ago to campaign for your senator, who has been very pro-choice and has really been wonderful uh, in helping in the U.S. Congress uh, in all kinds of different ways. Okay. Was that the pharmacy in Broadus? Now? I'm not familiar with the town. That sounds right. That sounds right to me, too. Are there any other initiatives or anything that you know of coming up in Montana? Yes. Um, you probably should ask... Uh, the Planned Parenthood people. Okay. But yeah, there are a couple of referendums that are very critical. Okay, I'll ask Stacy about that. Yeah, so while you're here, do that. Yeah. Because okay. she and I talked about it, she'll be talking about it tonight. Okay, now what about um, your experience with this case? Can you just give us a little bit of your sure. background? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, if you had asked me in college what I was gonna do, I would have said I'm gonna teach eighth graders to love Beowulf, and I tried. And I thought, I better go to graduate school. Uh, I went to law school, uh, one of five women in my class. And when I got out of law school, could not get a job with a law firm. And a group of women, uh, including Judy Smith, a woman who now lives in Missoula, uh, came to me uh, with a couple of men and said, we've been gathering information about where women could get illegal but safe abortions. Could we tell them this information, or would we be prosecuted as accomplices? And I said, I don't know. I'll go to the law library and look it up. Now, if you had said to me, if you go to the law library, you will still be talking about this in 38 years, I would never have believed it. But sure enough, that trip to the law library was the beginning of Roe versus Wade. Uh, it ended up being one of two cases to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. And I will never forget going before the Supreme Court. It's such an awesome place. Uh, you come in at the back, very heavy red velvet curtains. You go through and you see what look like three sections of church pews. On the left is a section called the three-minute section for tourists. And then sections for people first come, first serve to hear the argument. If you're arguing a case, you have, when you take your place, no further than from me to you would be the Chief Justice. And right there is a handmade goose quill pen. It is a souvenir that dates back to the time of Thomas Jefferson as a custom for you to take for having argued in the Supreme Court, because so few people ever get to do that. Uh, and then you, I had a hundred reporters sitting to my left. And then to the right was the section for the Attorney General of Texas, and beyond that, guests and family of the justices. When I left court that day, you have one hour for a U.S. Supreme Court case, 30 minutes per side. And the theory is that the justices with their clerks have read all the briefs. And in our case, the brief stack was about that high, because it wasn't just our brief. But then there were all kind of amicus curiae or friend of the court briefs. For example, the American Medical Association, the American Nurses Association, a lot of medical groups saying, you've got to change the law. We had a lot of religious briefs in our favor, like the Board of Christian Social Concerns of the United Methodist Church, the United Church of Christ, several of the Jewish groups, a whole series of religious groups. You had some uh, population groups like ZPG and others that said ought to be a woman's decision. You had a woman's brief by lots of the leading women. So there was a big stack of briefs in our favor and a stack against us as well. I went home and ran for the legislature because they don't tell you the day you're there whether you've won or lost. 
went home, ran for the legislature, was the first woman ever elected from Austin, Travis County, to the Texas House of Representatives. And I was there as a new legislator on January 22, 1973, and the phone rang. And a reporter from the New York Times said, does Miss Weddington have a comment today about Roe versus Wade? And my assistant, who answered the phone, said, should she? And the reporter said, it was decided today. And my assistant said, how was it decided? And the reporter said, she won it, seven to two. So if you come to my office today, you will see the handmade goose quill pen. And if you win a case, you can write in and pay for a color picture of the justices of that time and then request that they sign it. So I have an autographed color photograph of the justices of 1973. And sometimes people say, well, can you get one if you lose? And I say, I don't know. I've never lost in the Supreme <laughs> Court. But the truth is I haven't been back since then. I'm still defending Roe versus Wade. It's why to me Planned Parenthood is so important because Planned Parenthood is an organization that is devoted to helping people have the medical, the clinical, the psychological counseling to be able to make their own decisions and to be able to carry them out. Uh, Planned Parenthood is such a wonderful organization and it's great to be back in Montana and it's especially nice to be here for Planned Parenthood. So what are you doing now? Like, it, mm -hmm. as far as with you still defending Roe versus Wade, what do you do? You travel all over? Um, Combination, okay. yeah. So first, uh, I help to support organizations that support Roe versus Wade and the principle of choice. Uh, for example, I did the 35th anniversary lunch for NARAL, which is the National Abortion Rights Action uh, League. Um, I've done a number of things for Planned Parenthood. Uh, trying to work when there are cases going to the Supreme Court, working with the attorneys uh, on how to present their cases, uh, doing a number of teleconferences and continuing legal education sessions for lawyers on the aspects of what's involved. And of course, I will be involved in the election because I do think it is, it's the critical element uh, between now and the end of this year, and I want to be sure someone who supports the principles of Roe is elected president. Did you know Oh, that? and then I teach at the University oh, of Texas. <laughs> I'm sorry, yes, I teach one class that's uh, in the fall for pre people who have 3.5 and above averages. Great students, and they're people who think they want to go to law school. So we use a law school case book, they do research at the law school library. You know, it's a real joy to teach my students. Um, and I bet they enjoy being in your class, too. They, you know, it's so interesting because most of the time students in a class of 30, you'll have five or six that are really the top of the class, and the others are a combination of middle and lower. And in my class, everybody's a top student. So it really... Um, makes them work harder, study harder, and enjoy the other people in class with them. When you were um, getting prepared for your case for the Supreme Court, did you have any idea that it would have this big of an impact on the U.S.? No, not really. Now, I knew it was important because any time the Supreme Court is going to accept a case on a certain situation, you know it's going to be important. But I did not anticipate it would be the case that we hear about, that we read about. There was even a movie made called Roe versus Wade. And Amy Madigan, the woman who was the wife in Fields of Dreams, played me. So I saw her back in January and laughing about there were two Sarah Weddingtons in the room. Uh, but it is a case that has captured the public attention, some with approval and some with disapproval. But there's no question, for women, it was the key to women being able to decide continuing school, employment, family, all kinds of issues about when, when their timing for important events would be and what their choices would be. And so it is still, from the time I argued it and won it to today, one of the very key cases. In fact, most people say for the fall election, there'll probably be three key things, the war, the economy, 
and issues of choice, Roe versus Wade. Did you think that this case would still be getting so much attention today? No. The day I won it, if anybody had said, you will still be talking about this in 35 years, I would have thought they were out of their minds. Because I assumed, like other cases, it's decided, it's accepted, you go on and you work on other issues. And in fact, I did in the Texas legislature. Uh, for example, that was a time when if a woman accused someone of rape, her character was often what was on trial. And so we changed it. So any uh, evidence of prior sexual contact, not with the defendant, but with somebody else, could not be introduced at trial unless there was a hearing outside the presence of the jury to decide if it was relevant. For example, that was a time if you were a teacher in our public schools in Texas, if you got pregnant, you had to quit or you would be fired. And so we passed a law saying you can't fire teachers simply for being pregnant. Uh, it was a time when women could only play half-court basketball. And I played basketball, but I couldn't understand why we couldn't keep running when we got to the center line. And at that point, after two dribbles, it was called traveling, a technical violation. And of course, now women run up and down the court. And if you told a basketball player of today, oh, you've got to quit at the center court, they would just keep running. But it was a time before. It was, I carried the legislation to say, you cannot refuse to give a woman credit simply on the basis that she has a husband and she has to get his signature. If she's got income, if she's got money, and she can financially pay credit card bills, she ought to be allowed to have a credit card. So there were a whole series of things that we've worked on, not just the choice issues, but those in many ways are the central issues. People have to be able to decide the number and spacing of their own children. Um, what about your book? What, when did you write that? And I wrote my book in 92. Okay. It was at the time Bill Clinton was running. And I wanted to put on the page the story of the case of Roe versus Wade. Because I thought, you know, someday I'm not going to want to keep talking about this. <laughs> and at least it'll be in books. People could access it that way. Uh, it seems I do still keep talking about it. So now I want to write a second book. And it will be much more on leadership issues. You know, how does a person prepare for leadership? What are the skills they need to learn? What are the pluses and minuses of leadership? And there certainly are some of both. So I'm anxious to start writing another book. But I won't do it till after the fall presidential election. Are you going to travel all around the country? I will be. For the election? Uh, for the election, okay. yes. Because I think it's just such a critical year, and who gets elected is so critical. And it's got to be somebody who is for the principles of Roe, that women get to make basic decisions with consultation with the men in their lives and their physicians. But they are the key decision makers. And maybe one last thing. What was this like for you, being part of all of this? I mean, the very central part. Uh, you know, it's exciting, uh, and it's also a real feeling of responsibility. Uh, my father's a Methodist preacher, and I'll never forget coming home to Lubbock, Texas one time, and those opposed to my position had, that was before you had the security we do now, uh, they were at the gate uh, chanting and saying unkind things as I came off the plane, and I thought my father was going to get in a fight. And that would have been terrible. And so it's like you want to protect your family, my father, my parents. Uh, but the plus of it, even though you may be exposed to people who really disagree, and sometimes not just me, but me as a principal of the case or as a representative of the case, but on the other hand, the pluses so outweigh that. You know, I think all of us want to feel that we have made a difference. And I know I have. Uh, when Time Magazine wrote the article, 80 Days That Changed the World, and Roe versus Wade is one of those. I think it was just a recognition that for countless women and families in this country, Roe is a central part of their being able to make their own decisions. And so, obviously, I've received a lot of awards. I've been able to meet a lot of interesting people. Um, so I think the key thing is that from the time I was in college, 
I thought there were so many things that were wrong that shouldn't be that way. And we have really been able to push back barriers. Sometimes they were barriers that were discriminating. Sometimes they were barriers of attitudes. Sometimes they were barriers of laws. But we have been able to push back those barriers and make a much wider world for women to work in, to live in, within which to make their decisions. And I think Planned Parenthood is a principal part of that. Because for so many women who don't have that much income, they provide the services. They can't provide other places. For many women who are young, they are there when there are not other places for them to go. And so I feel very strongly about the value of Planned Parenthood, the principles they stand for, and the services they provide. And I'm really proud to have been part of that.